Yes. Hello, everyone. I am Kimberly Funderburg, Director of Guilford Parents Academy, and I have here with me today Sherry Rigowski and Dabika Dillard, who are both Guilford County Schools psychologists. Sherry Rigowski is the Positive Culture and Climate Coordinator in the District Social Emotional Learning Department and the mother of two adult daughters. Dabika Dillard is the supervisor for Exceptional Children Preschool and the mother of a teenager. We are so happy to be here today to talk with you two about how you can support your children during uncertain times. Ms. Rogowski, my first question is to you. Why this information now? Ms. Thunderbird, we know that these times currently are unprecedented for our society. Our nation is experiencing multiple extraordinary events, including the COVID pandemic, economic crisis, and a historic response to racism. We also know that these events can cause uncertainty and feelings of anxiety for the members of our society, and that of course includes our kids. These feelings may cause different reactions to our children depending on their age. We really wanted parents to understand that these reactions are normal given our times, and that we also wanted to, uh, for them to have some strategies for, so that they could help their children weather these times. I see, and I, I really um, understand how these times can be uncertain for our parents and families. And I know we'll get to the specifics in a moment, but are there any general themes or areas our parents need to pay close attention to? Actually, there are. Um, there are three areas that parents should be paying uh, very close attention to. The first one is self-care, making sure that they are taking care of themselves so they can take care of their kids. The second is maintaining connections for themselves and their children. And then also the, the third is consistency. So let's take a look at, at the first theme, um, which is the self-care. Parents need to make sure that they themselves have the capacity to support their children. There's a quote that says you can't pour from an empty vessel. So as parents, we need to make sure that we're keeping our vessel full so that we can then support our children. There are ideas on how to develop a self-care plan on the Social Emotional Learning Department web website in a resources uh, for families link. So parents can go there and find that resource. Parents may want to look there to make sure that they have some ideas so that they can make a plan to take care of themselves. The second theme um, as, we, as we talk through this is that um, one of connections. So um, we need to make sure that we put strategies in place so that we can maintain connections with, uh, with people that can support us. All human um, beings need to, have, need to be connected um, to each other um, and to have those positive connections. So we need to make sure that we, that we stay connected to our family, um, to our friends and that we help our children do the same. Then the third theme of consistency um, is that we try to maintain um, a, uh, a ma make sure that we're providing a safe and supportive environment uh, for our uh, in our family setting. And you're gonna see strategies that um, suggest uh, ways to make sure that you're maintaining consistent routines as much as possible. Um, we know that a lot of our routines have been broken during this time. And then adding new routines if you have to, so that you could create a calm um, space and that um, you're aware of mitigating some of your children's habits that may be co uh, contributing to their anxieties. Great, I know that we are hearing in the news about anxiety just centered around the election. Um, mm -hmm. Families are experiencing um, just signs of stress um, just around the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so this is some great information that I feel our parents need to be aware of, not only just be aware of, but take advantage and use in their homes. So thank you, Ms. Rogowski. I want to now turn to Ms. Dillard and ask her about some of the possible responses we may see in our preschool age children who may be experiencing some type of anxiety at this time. Thanks, Ms. Vandermark. You know, as parents, we need to first recognize that our children may be struggling with worrying about their safety, their family safety. And so when you think about our preschool children, they may not have the language, obviously, to express 
how they how they're feeling so to express those fears those worries so you're going to see anxieties kind of manifest themselves in other ways whether it be through um that um the fear of being alone bad dreams maybe you're seeing uh your children have nightmares um loss of previous previously um acquired skills like being able to go to the bathroom like they're potty trained and all of a sudden there's a regression of some kind um you may see changes in their appetite maybe even in their sleep patterns where you had a child who had no problem going to bed and staying asleep at night and now all of a sudden they cannot get to sleep um so those are some things that we really have to consider and look out for um and even an increase in temper tantrums. As you know, this, this is definitely can be normal or typical in students this age. But when you start to see an increase in that, in whining or being clingy, then that might be a sign of, of anxiety uh, demonstrating or displaying itself in that pre-K age student. So we need to remember that, you know, some of this is normal. So we just don't want to overthink it, but we do want to be observant in uh, what we're seeing in our students. So we want to go ahead and provide those extra support um, if we see that increase in behavior, if that makes sense. Okay, Ms. Dillard. So what if I'm a parent and I have a preschooler who starts to display some of these behaviors? What should I do? So Remember that uh, Ms. Rogowski indicated that there were some general themes here uh, when it comes to strat strategies to support children. So most important, increasing and maintaining connections and maintaining that safe environment for the family, right? With some consistency, um, as well, as much as consistency as you can arrange in your own household. So. When you're thinking about maintaining and enhancing those connections during this time, it's important that we make ourselves available to our children, right? So of course, we're going through some things ourselves as we deal with what's happening around us, but we gotta remember them and try to make ourselves available to them. Um, when we're with them, we have to be calm as well. So children look to adults for guidance on how to react to stressful events right so our calm demeanor will help reassure them so that's something that we have to really think about and keep at the forefront of our minds when it comes to our um especially our young children so when we're dealing with those behavior changes that i just mentioned previously we need to make sure that we approach these situations with compassion and, uh, and acceptance because remember how we feel so you can Im imagine that they may be feeling some of those things as well. Mm -hmm. So realizing, you know, our children can be stressed just like us um, and that we have to set limits in a gentle and firm way. So we don't want to throw parenting out the window with this. That's not what we're saying. Um, limit settings actually help our children feel safe because they understand the limits and the parameters when we set those up for them. Kids actually thrive on that. Um, we can also teach our children ways to calm themselves by engaging with simple breathing activities um, and definitely physical activities, which is so important to keep them moving, keep them going. Um, when we consider maintaining a feeling of safety at home, we know that routines provide comfort to our children. So we wanna maintain those routines as best we can, right? Um, we may need to create new routines, of course. So for example, many of our children's school routines have been interrupted. Uh, so new learning routines and new schedules have been put into place. We're learning in a whole different way. Even pre-K students are having to learn through this computer. Kids, three and four year olds know what Zoom is now, right? Um, so it's a whole new world, even, even for them. But the key is once they have the new routines that are established that we maintain them as much as we can. Um, one routine that is especially good for preschoolers is that bedtime routine that involves calming activities such as reading, you know, playing some music or doing those breathing exercises that we've already discussed. 
like I know when my, my daughter was younger, like the bedtime routine especially was huge for us. She knew exactly what happened after um, bath time and the things that we did. We did everything in the same order that resulted in her going to sleep and hopefully feeling safe and comforter, comforted at night. Mm -hmm. um, so she really enjoyed, enjoyed that and was something that she looked forward to. So things of that nature can be very helpful. Okay, these sound like some good strategies. And I'll tell you for myself, I've practiced the breathing. I've practiced just quietness and playing soft music. I love looking at YouTube playlists for the stress-free music. So I love these strategies. So we've talked a little bit about our preschool children. I want to turn our attention to school-age children. Ms. Rogowski, can you tell us some of the behaviors we might see in our school-age children and then let us know that they may be expressing some sort of stress? Uh, absolutely. So um, actually, you're going to see in school-age children some of the similar behaviors that um, Ms. Diller talked about with preschoolers. For example, in this age group, you, they could also demonstrate that whining and clinging and aggressive behaviors or have nightmares, sleep uh, disturbances, and uh, not have the same appetite. I think the key is what changes are you seeing in your child? So what looks different from how they were before all of the, these things happen? Um, in addition, this age group may demonstrate a loss of interest in connecting with their peers, and they could also have problems with um, attention and concentration. I do want to point out that attention and concentration for this age group is, can be difficult when we're asking them to sit in front of a computer. So, the, so if they're having trouble sitting in for all of their lessons, I think across the, the, uh, the age group, that would be very normal to see um, because we're asking them to do some very different behaviors right now. Um, the other thing you might see, though, is with uh, their uh, usually higher developed language skills versus what you might see in a preschooler, they may begin talking about not feeling well, they may complain about headaches, stomach aches, and they may even actually begin telling you about um, fears um, that they might be experiencing. So listen closely to that. <clears throat> so, and when we're looking at the strategies to support this group, um, these are, again are similar to supporting preschoolers and that they're generally in the area of maintaining and enhancing connections and feelings and safety um, for uh, security at home. It's important again to use adults um, to uh, it, that you as adults pro project a sense of calm. So remember I told you you had to take care of yourself. This is one of the reasons so that you can stay calm um, when you are dealing with your children. Um, especially if we're seeing, seeing behavior changes, um, we uh, continue, as uh, Ms. Dillard said, to set gentle but firm limits. So again, you continue to, to do that limit setting even with these um, different behaviors because this helps them feel safe. This helps them know that you're going to help them put some guardrails or parameters around their, uh, around their behavior. The other thing that you can do is you can help, um, help teach them, help them learn how to calm themselves when their emotions are strong. Um, and this can be different for different kids, but some of the things you can do as, um, as Ms. Funderburk, as you've said that you have enjoyed doing is those breathing exercises. Uh, I can't stress enough regular physical activity for our kids um, is very important. And if you're into something like yoga, it's never too young to start that with your, uh, with your children too. We also need to try to maintain those old routines as much as possible. Again, I know it can be very difficult giving these, these times, but, um, but any routine that you had in place, you can maintain, do it. Um, but we, again, might have to uh, establish new ones. And one of the new routines probably is the time they need to sit down in front of the computer to do their, um, to do their lessons. Um, we can also help our children feel a part of the family unit by helping them to, uh, to engage in, in, in household chores. And I know that sounds like something that they're not going to want to do, that might be true, but it also, if children are engaged in whatever are, that has to be done around the household and you remind them how much they're helping the family and being a part of the, your family unit and community, 
that helps them feel and stay connected. It also helps them make them, uh, makes them feel like they're an important part of the family. We do need to monitor our children's TV and social media, media viewing, and we might need to limit what they're seeing, especially if we noticed a, an increase in anxiety after they watch a particular thing uh, or see or hear a particular thing. Um, when we, we, they do see or hear confusing information, um, it's really important that you sit down and have a conversation with them um, a, about that information. Here's a place where you can interject your family values. So if, if they have heard or seen something that's against your family values, take, to, take the time to connect that to those values um, when you're talking to them to, uh, uh, about what they've seen. Um, and if your child is a, a, exposed to discrimination um, of themselves or others, now's the time to let them know that in your family, um, this is what you believe around that. Um, and uh, this is how you would, uh, that they need to, uh, uh, to handle that particular situation. We can help our children feel connected to others by spending time with them and taking the time to talk and listen. And when we're talking with them, we need to, uh, we can help them name their emotions, which is really important, that emotional li uh, literacy. And then we can also provide uh, any facts that, we're there, uh, that are needed. In fact, around emotional literacy and naming the uh, emotion, uh, emotions, there's a, some simple emotional check-in strategies that you're going to find on the, uh, again, the Guilford County website under the Social Emotional Learning uh, Department. Look for something called a mood meter. It will help you help your children name their emotions. It's important to follow your child's lead in determining how much information they need to hear um, wait for them to ask questions, ask if they have any questions and add in that information, but you don't have to give them all the information if they're not asking for it. Make sure you do answer their questions honestly though with enough information, but without unneeded additional details. Um, you can encourage your child to express uh, him or herself through games, drawing, storytelling, um, you, might, uh, you might want to also engage with your children in games or other activities for fun or other projects. It's an excellent idea to get them involved in projects to help others, such as distributing masks to neighbors, for example, or collecting food for those who need it that will help them feel like, again, they're doing something to help during these very anxious times. Find ways for your child to, say, to say, stay safely in touch with their friends uh, and family. And a lot of that means virtual, uh, through virtual means. I know it's not the same, but getting your uh, child on Zoom or something so that they can talk to their grandparents is an excellent idea uh, for helping them um, stay connected. Um, there are also even some really fun games that your child can play together with others online. So you might want to uh, explore some of those. Again, these are excellent suggestions. I love when you talked about getting our children engaged in household chores. I'm sure our parents are going to really take advantage of that strategy. <laughs> Not only will it help out the household, but it'll take their mind off some of the anxiety that they may be feeling. Mm -hmm. So thank mm -hmm. you for that. So I want to talk now about the adolescents in our lives. So share with us some information about how we can assist our adolescents during these uncertainty times. I would love to answer this one, Mr. Fun Ms. Funderbolt, since I have the uh, honor of raising a 15-year-old myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in our adolescence, you... <laughs> You may see some of the same behaviors that we talked about already that we see in our school age and sometimes even in our preschool students. Um, the key though is that we pay attention to these behavioral changes. Um, adolescence is a turbulent time when things are going great <laughs> and we're not dealing with a pandemic or during a big election. Um, so we need to look out for things. You know, Adolescents sleep late as a matter of course. Um, if you have one, you know, you knock on the door, you may think, are, are you here? Are you, are you alive? Are you, are you well? Um, they sleep a lot. Um, so you may notice that, and because you're home, you may notice it more. Um, 
but it may not be really anything to worry about. Uh, so some of the behavioral changes you might see in sleep and even appetite disturbances, physical complaints like headaches, rashes even, problems with attention concentration, and increased statements of worry. Those are some of the behaviors that you're looking for. Like there's an increase, an uptick in some of these things as you think and listen and observe um, your adolescents. So if your child is showing, uh, I guess, greater agitation or even a decrease in energy, you know, they're taking uh, more risk. You see them doing things that are just outside of the ordinary um, and especially with their health um, during this time. They might not be wearing a mask on purpose or, or something of that nature or not, you know, really washing their hands and doing things like that that they should be doing. You may even see that they uh, tend to want to isolate themselves away from their peers and even you uh, in the same home. You might see more of that. Um, this age group is tricky though when you're looking at these things. So, you know, when you think about the, the strategies that we would use um, in those categories that Ms. Rogowski talked about with making connections and belonging um, and helping with that structured environment and being consistent with it, right? To ensure, you know, that feeling of safety. Adolescents, you know, everything is about their peer. So peer years is what we're going through. So peer relationships, this is important at that age group. So one of the best strategies to encourage your child to stay in touch with friends and family um, through those uh, virtual means, unfortunately, for the most part, is gonna be important. Um, you will also need to make yourself available to hang out, uh, play games, engage in physical activities with your child. So for example, if you're both runners, you might go for a run together. Maybe that's not even something that you all consider doing together. Um, I know for me during these times of pandemic and all that's going on, something that um, me and my child started to do together, which is not something that we did. We found a series to watch and a certain time every evening, we would get together for an hour in my bed to watch this, this, um, this series. I won't tell you what it was, but it was a series and it was fun and we connected. And I told her I was uh, gonna be providing some of this information to others. And that's the first thing that she said, well, tell them what we did, because that was something I'll never forget during the time of pandemic, which was interesting to me because I didn't think anything of it um, to that extent. So it, it was just great to hear that, that that's something that she remembered that she and I um, have together. So think about things like that. Um, and of course, take time to talk and, and listen and encourage them. Um, if it's not you, maybe it's another caring adult uh, in the family, a family friend, aunt, uncle, or someone else that they can, uh, you know, open up to and share some of the, uh, their feelings, uh, just their interests, or, you know, just to hang out. Mm -hmm. But of course, during this time, do your best. Provide facts to your child. Encourage them to learn more by pointing them toward appropriate websites, books, of course, <laughs> you know, reading information as well, right? Um, but of course, have those conversations about any stigmas, discrimination that's going on, um, and just make sure that, that they're aware of what's going on and clarify any misinformation that you hear. Um, you can do some of this by trying to stay aware of the media viewing habits that they may engage in um, and whatever they're hearing, just be open to those conversations. Uh, help your child focus, of course, on helping others through community projects, can't beat that, um, and planning support strategies for the whole family. So it's important as with other ages that you stay calm, like uh, Ms. Rogowski talked about, and um, reassure and approach behavior changes with that compassion and acceptance and just being gentle, but of course, setting those firm limits. I'm telling you, kids thrive with limits.
um, at any of these ages. Sometimes this is going to take some reminding for ourselves, of course, that these are still young humans, even though they may appear to be adults. Some of them are bigger than us, right? Um, we're starting to look up to them sometimes. But getting our child to be involved with um, household chores, which is what we've talked about before, and even supporting younger siblings if they haven't and helping out problem problem solving family issues, of course, um, can be very helpful in keeping that family connection going, which remember we said is one of the strategies that's so important right now. Um, keeping those routines as much as possible, of course, can be helpful. And reminding your child one way to stay safe is to use appropriate hygiene, like we talked about, washing those hands, wearing those masks, especially now. Um, routines continue to be important at this age. So again, supporting uh, your child by, by helping them to schedule those activities they need to complete school. Again, we're doing school in a whole new and different way. And for some, they'll, they'll catch on and some others may need support mm -hmm. and how to be independent in, in doing school um, at home virtually. And finally, try to monitor what they're, see what they're seeing on TV and the websites that they're visiting and just ensure you are having deliberate conversations about some of the things that, um, that they might be viewing. Teaching this age group, these adolescents, how to determine if, they, um, if what they're seeing and hearing in the media is true is also important. So always asking those questions, always knowing to go uh, to do research in other ways um, is, gonna be, is gonna be great for them as well. So true, Ms. Dillard. Um, we need to give our adolescents the tools to determine fact from opinion, which can be difficult for all of us. But the process of filtering the information can help all of us feel more empowered to know the right course of action in these uncertain times. I want to thank Ms. Rogowski and Ms. Dillard for being with us today to outline some strategies to support our children. These are some practical ways that we can help them. As you support your children during these times, remember that if you need additional recommendations or support, you can contact the school counselor, school social worker, or school psychologist at the school that your child attends. We would like to leave you with this quote. Don't try to be perfect. Life isn't, no one is. Use mistakes and mishaps as opportunities to grow tolerance and to teach. There is such a thing as happy accidents. And love, 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 and listen, listen, listen. Thank you, and we hope that you'll use some of these strategies in your home. Thank you. Thank you.